Hello and welcome. Let's get started with the corporate disclaimer. The views I'm going to express are those of my own and not of, of my employer. What if I told you in the midst of this pandemic and recession and unemployment, there is a $7 trillion opportunity? If you are listening to the talking heads on TV, then one can't blame you to think that we live in the worst of times. What if we flipped the frame and instead asked, do we live in the best of times? One stat after another shows that the human quality of life has dramatically improved over the last hundred odd years, and not just by a few percent points, by multiple double digit percentages. Life expectancy, poverty, literacy. As the adage goes, let no crisis go to waste. Sit back, listen in, and I'll help you take advantage. So how have humans had so much success? It's a result of a series of revolutions. It started with the Gutenberg printing press in the 1400s, and that brought the cost of book publishing down, and we went from an oral culture to a literate culture, and that sparked the European Renaissance. Then came the Industrial Revolution, where mills mechanized the production of textiles, so the cost of clothes came down. Then came the steam engine, and the cost of transportation came down. Then electricity and engineering enabled the development of massive roads, bridges, and intercontinental railway, Large steamships were also built, and this all brought the cost of trade down. Then the automobiles and industrialization enabled mass production, and that ushered the modern era of consumer consumption. Then we had telecoms and computer revolution. Telecom made communication cheaper, and computers brought the cost of arithmetic down, so you didn't need a team of mathematicians to calculate where a cannonball would fall. A computer would do that. So keep all of this in mind when we talk about AI. AI is bringing the cost of something down. What is that something? And I'll connect the dots in a bit. So if you look back at the last decade, in the first five years, a series of companies achieved the $1 billion market valuation. And then the pace with which startups achieved that $1 billion market valuation increased very, very rapidly and you'll notice that most of these companies are software companies. And this is a concept that Mark Anderson has labeled software eating the world. So if you think about the revolutions that I shared earlier, most of them were sequential in nature. However, now change is coming and it's coming really fast from multiple different angles. From obviously the software and AI side to robotics, to biotech, to blockchain, 3D printing, quantum computing, and solar energy. Up until very recently, humans just had one identity, a physical one. And over the last 15 odd years, we've actually created a new alter identity, a digital identity. And this is causing a lot of the turmoil that we're seeing, as an example, fake news. Another thing to consider is that, again, up until very recently, humans didn't own communication. Communication happened one to many at the speed of the horse. So if you were an emperor, a king, a general, a pope, a dictator, even a CEO, you owned communication. And the internet has inverted the power structures. And now you could be actually tweeting right now. So we own communication. And again, connecting back to the earlier point, this is actually wreaking havoc because humans don't have a propensity to change and change this fast, this quickly. And this is, as a result, causing a lot of the friction that we see around us. So moving on to the next point, problem spaces shift. So 30 years ago, it, the question was, do I take this picture? And now we take so many pictures that the problem space has become a filtering one. So now let's talk about how we can take advantage of all of the change that's happening around us. So it all starts with having a killer purpose, solving a problem, a massive transformative purpose. Google's MTP is organizing the world's information. TED Talks is all about ideas worth spreading. What is your purpose as an individual, as a department, as an entire company? Craft a product that fulfills that purpose. Your product should solve a problem. Do people need your product? Can they live without it? Why do they keep using it? Search for an area with the most pain. That's where you will find the most opportunity. Orient your product strategy 
be hyper focused on the problem you are trying to solve. And you know what? It can be counterintuitive. In World War II, the American Air Force traced anti aircraft fire. Obvious where to add armor? Not really, actually. These are the planes that made it back, so adding armor inversely is the right solution. And this is called a narrative violation. Would you pay $30 per month for email? Likely no. Now rethink it. What if there was a product that would reduce your email headache by 50%? Hmm, maybe you'd consider it. Question the prevailing narrative as you're thinking about how to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. It's also fundamentally an imagination problem. At Bank of America, our CEO talks about the power of and. We can cut costs and offer better customer service. I'm sure you're wondering how. Very simply, that's why at Bank of America, we envisioned a smarter way to offer customer service. We envisioned Erica, our chatbot. So you don't have to dial 800 and all those digits, etc., to get to an agent. You can ask, um, a chatbot and you get your answer and you move on. At Bank of America, my group's MTP is to eliminate manual processing. An inordinate amount of our people's time is spent on inefficient manual work. We are implementing intelligent automation and AI to enable a shift so that our people are freed up to focus on more value-added activities. So, we live in a designed world, whether it comes to our physical life or our digital life. Our quality of life is directly correlated with the quality of design. Just think about the massive impact that COVID has had on our design lives. Take the simple example of grocery shopping and how it has completely changed. We can now on a click of a button order groceries. When it comes to design, think front stage and backstage. Abstract the user experience in a way to hide all the complexity so that the front stage is super simple Backstage is where all the complexity happens and is hidden. So think about the abstraction in a layered way when you design your product to tackle the problem you're trying to solve. Think systems, think principles, design a machine that just runs. And you know what? Design for good. I don't think Robinhood's founders started by saying, let's design an addictive platform to encourage novices to overtrade at bad prices so we can profitably route order flow to large market makers like Citadel Securities. Design with good intentions. So design for advantage. Subsonic missiles costing low millions of dollars can easily neutralize American aircraft carriers that cost $10 billion. So leverage your assets in a way to fight above your weight class. And also design with AI in mind. People overcomplicate AI. It's really simple. It's actually one word. Prediction. Like computers brought the cost of arithmetic down, AI is bringing the cost of prediction down. What TikTok video would you like? What ails you? And remember the four Ds of design thinking. Discover, define, develop, and deliver. It is a relentlessly iterative process. In the initial cycles, think of the MVP. Focus, focus, focus on the killer features. Shipping is a feature too. And then let the customer feedback drive the product development. And obviously avoid product drift. Remember the F word here, focus. In the end, if we fail to design, we design for failure. Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO, keenly observed, software is the most malleable tool created by humans. This is so true in the times we live. How else could we have engineered such a massive shift to working from home? Think of an algorithm that tackles the problem you are trying to solve. Google revolutionized search by a simple technical insight. They created an algorithm that counted the number and quality of links to a page. Design the solution to your problem with an algorithm in mind. It doesn't need to be a novel technical insight like Google's. Derivative tech works as well. You don't have to invent the next killer ML algo. You just have to figure out a way to use it in a novel way in your space. And also keep in mind, the critical, critical insight generally here is that software has a low fixed cost, no marginal costs, and is super easy to distribute. This makes it the channel of choice for most startups. 
Use software to compete with well-established incumbents. Software applies to all of you in big corporations as well. You have to have a startup mentality. Think of your space as a startup. How can you nimbly use software? Next comes interfaces. And interfaces have two sides to the coin. You can leverage interfaces and build interfaces. So if you're a startup wanting to build a telehealth solution, you can use Twilio's API to quickly enable video conference. Instead of focusing precious tech resources on commodity tech, free up time to focus on what's important. And the other side to the coin is, what are the interfaces that you're building into your software? So your product can be part of a vertical integration. Much of the tech that was once complicated is becoming demystified. It's becoming commodity tech. You don't need to be techie to build great products. It started with Wix for simple websites and then moved towards how Shopify, anyone can build an e-commerce operation. So now with citizen development, you can wrangle and manipulate data using Trifecta and Alteryx. You can visualize and dashboard data using Power BI and Databox. You can design and build complicated web pages using Buildfire and Uncork. You can also implement sophisticated machine learning using Data Robot or H2O without writing a line of code for any of these four activities. At Bank of America, we have some of the best of breed tools and they are all part of the Phoenix stack. We have also built an automation system. So if you think about what a knowledge worker does, a knowledge worker gets information, performs some logic on that information, and then reaches a conclusion. So our automation platform does those three activities in an automated, systematic way. So we connect to data, we perform the logic that humans are doing with business rules and AI, and then we reach a conclusion. So this system can automate knowledge worker activity. And it is a complete platform. Automation is just one part of a five-pronged strategy. It starts with also dashboards, workflow, and alerts and notification, and then lastly is search. So collectively, these five components perform are, are, make up our automation stack. So automation is one leg in a five-legged stool. And the way to think about this is that there are four other critical components here. That once you augment automation, you make it really, really powerful. So it starts with dashboards, and it, you add workflow. Everyone's tracking some widgets, right? Think of the FedEx model. You're tracking your packages. Then you have alerts and notification. And then lastly, you have search. So if you put all these five components together, you, you basically come up with a very powerful automation platform. Data is fueling this phase of innovation. YouTube, Instagram, Netflix, all leveraged user data to make recommendations that worked and worked well. However, TikTok took it to a brand new level, a super fast algo that works after the first view, the first click. Addictive recommendations. It works to the tune of two billion downloads, the second most downloaded app, and not to mention the hue and cry that is happening politically. So data is what is fueling driverless cars. It starts with maps being digitized, then all the data that is being collected as part of the driverless car. And if you think about the amount of data that's being created, the World Economic Forum says that 463 exabytes of data will be created every day by 2025. That's the equivalent of 200 million movies every day. That's how much data is being created, and it's gonna fuel the next generation TikToks, the next generation of driverless cars. Here's another example. A doctor can see 20,000 unique patients over a lifetime of practice. What if we can train a machine with a million records? That's exactly what Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York did. It took its vast database of patient records, and this data set included hundreds of variables on patients drawn from test results and doctor visits. A machine learning model was trained. Without any expert instruction, it discovered patterns hidden in the data, and it proved materially better at predicting disease from cancer to schizophrenia. Now, 
how does data actually help on the machine learning front? It all starts with business understanding, and then data discovery and sourcing, and then data governance, data connections, and then data prep. All of these collectively result in insights that are being drawn. And from here, on the insights front is where machine learning comes in. And you start your machine learning activities with something called exploratory data analysis. You just kind of mess around with the data. And then you actually start feature engineering. And then off of the feature engineering, you train models. Then you share and collaborate with colleagues. And along the way, you're visualizing all of this in the form of dashboards. And that's the power of data, that you can harness it to enable the machine learning. So we did some interesting work mapping the COVID-related data on top of our branch geolocations to understand basically where COVID was spreading and to make informed decision about which branches to close and how quickly. And here's another way data really helps, anomaly detection. So if you think of a branch in Miami that is suddenly opening way too many um, accounts, that anomaly is detected by the machine, humans are alerted, and we can actually go and you know, investigate that. And so what we're doing is we're enabling a control room approach to actual automation. So if you think about, you know, in the world of driverless cars, the job of an Uber driver shifts from behind a wheel to behind a computer screen monitoring a fleet of cars, and that's what we're doing. Think of growth as a key feature of your product, not a marketing afterthought. For social networks, it was easy. It was the ad symbol. By tagging people, organizations from LinkedIn to Facebook to Twitter enabled phenomenal growth. Dropbox did it by offering free storage. If you got a friend to sign up, you both got free storage. Spread like wildfire. Airbnb rode the rails of the largest marketplace of its time. You could cross post from Airbnb to Craigslist with a single click of a button. So when you're designing your own product, whose rails are you gonna ride? So marketing was focused on just acquisition and activation. And that's where growth hacking is a lot more end-to-end. -end. Not just acquisition and activation, it takes it further. Retention, revenue, and referral. So sharing and tagging can be features in corporate apps. You just have to figure a way to actually include them into the product that you're building. So Near AL has a great framework to build an engaging product. It starts with a trigger, an internal itch. I'm bored, let me check Instagram to an external one, you get an email for a corporate app to go check something. And from the trigger, you go to action, some kind of behavior that gets to a reward. It has to be simple. And then the reward, make sure it's a variable reward. Make sure it's a mystery, it changes, otherwise expectations set in and users get bored. And then comes the last part, investment. Get the user to do something. By working a, a little, users store value in their product and that leads to stickiness. And that's how the cycle goes and goes. So next comes collaboration. And this is one that I've been thinking about a lot recently. Why is email necessary to communicate and to collaborate? If you build collaboration into the product, then you don't need email. Think about how we can simply review Word documents. We put all the reviews into Microsoft Word. You never have to leave the app. So if you can find a way to build collaboration into your product, you will increase the stickiness of the product. And then here's another thought. If you think about all the disparate units within a large bank or a large organization, you've got all sorts of vertical and horizontal functions. And the goal here is how do you use AI and automation to connect everything, to enable the growth, to enable the stickiness, to enable the actual collaboration that is gonna come and you make all of these connections kind of happen, and you unleash a tremendous amount of value. So think about your favorite app. Did you need to read a user manual to use it? Why are corporate apps so difficult? Delight your customers with a phenomenal user experience. The quality of a user experience has no ceiling. Look how far the iPhone has come, constantly improving. And user experience can also be a moat. The easier your product is, the stickier it will be. And also, catalyze the crowd. We had a naming competition, and we had hundreds of people participate. People are just learning to basically participate. And then also the power of diversity. 
And this comes in all sorts of forms, you know, whether it's race, gender, age, education background. Get a strong, diverse team together, and that will be critical as part of your product development side of things. And also, think about human behavior data. It's abundantly clear how personal data can be weaponized. A vice journalist posed as 100 senators to run ads on Facebook. And guess what? Facebook approved them all. If se senators can be impersonated, then God help us mere mortals. For sure, human behavior data will get regulated. So keep that in mind as you're designing your product. And take a page on Elon's playbook at Tesla. He basically dug himself into a small hole, dug himself out, then dug himself into a bigger hole, dug himself out, and then he dug himself into an even bigger hole and dug himself out. So think about a multi-generational plan. Think long-term. And also in corporate America, the nervous system attacks. And this is where parallelism is super, super critical. Think of what Match.com did with Tinder. They created, as part of their incubation unit, a completely different product, and the whole goal was to basically create a new product category. And when Match.com went public, Tinder represented 40% of its market cap. So think about being 10% different. Think over the last year if you've changed. If you haven't, you're being left behind. And you can do this as an individual, as a group, as an enterprise. Every year, be different 10%, 20%. So basically, you're always, always innovating. And the other thing to think about is that multi-gen plan that I mentioned. So think about Zoom. Its goal was to make video communication frictionless. Great. Phenomenal job in asking why it was hard to make a video call. And basically, they had 10 million daily meeting participants in December, and guess what? Now they have 300 million. But now they gotta ask what's next. So they shouldn't be asking the question now, why are you in the call in the first place? And that's how they can evolve their own product and think of that multi-gen strategy. So, in summary, to design the killer next-gen product, keep the seven rules in mind. Starts with having a purpose, designing with intent, having an algorithm at the heart, leveraging data, putting growth right into the product, harnessing the power of people, and then playing the long game. And oh, one more thing. Smart researchers were asked year over year how much solar power is going to get created. And year over year, they basically answered sequentially. While in actuality, the change that was happening was happening exponentially. So humans, we can't understand the power of exponential growth. So here's the trading floor from 2008. Eight years later, in 2016, the trading floor is empty. Change happens, and change happens really fast. Get ready for it. Thank you for watching.